the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh has a wonderful one-liner, and it is, it's not enough to suffer, you must touch peace too. Okay, and happiness, and ease, and well-being. I love that because it is so easy to get into a mindset of that this life is a problem that we're trying to solve. Okay. And in a daily way we, we lock into getting grim. I, I see it in myself, I see it in many, kind of trying to get through the day. So I'm starting uh, tonight's talk with a poem by the poet Hafez that I really love. It's called Tripping Over Joy. And he writes, What is the difference between your experience of existence and that of a saint? The saint knows that the spiritual path is a sublime chess game with God and that the beloved has just made such a fantastic move that the saint is now continually tripping over in joy and bursting out in laughter and saying, I surrender. Whereas, my dear, I am afraid you still think you have a thousand serious moves. So that's the title of tonight's talk, A Thousand Serious Moves. <laughs> I think it's a great line and um, it really sums up our trance in a certain way that we go about life and if you kind of catch yourself at any moment in some way we're on this track and we're on our way somewhere and it's kind of serious business. I'm not saying it's undiluted. They're, they're, we, we marble in our fun but we can get really grim. And in a way I could stop the talk right here and if all we did together perhaps for the next few weeks was had a reflection where we would pause and just say, well, right now am I, you know, in that trance of a thousand serious moves? It's a fabulous wake up. I play with that one a lot. But I'll talk since I have the time to talk tonight. <laughs> so it's an attitude that goes into spiritual life too and I think it's one of the big misunderstandings of Buddhism that uh, we're, it's all about suffering and that we're trying to purify and transform and, and in different ways master you know, the art of concentrating or whatever it happens to be that in some way um, there's a message that this spiritual thing is another project of trying to, that we're trying to get good at now, that's not what the Buddha taught and that's not the essence of any of the wisdom traditions. But it's easy with our mentality to take it on that way. Self-improvement. So, what I'd like to say mostly is that while attention to suffering, suffering's part of the truth of what is, is absolutely essential to wake up so is attention to joy, to the natural joy of being alive. And because we're so conditioned to get grim and be on that thousand series moves thing, it's really important that we realize this is as much a part of the path as anything else. Why? When we're really present, there is a natural happiness and well-being that emerges. It's part of who we are. It's an expression of our deepest nature. So it's part of our commitment to being all that we are, to say it's not enough to suffer. Okay, so we'll, we'll explore this some um, uh, tonight. I'd like to, maybe tonight and next week, explore really what are the gateways to this happiness. In other words, what is it? What stops us? You have to be able to see what stops us. And then how do we really um, wake up out of this tendency to get grim and feel that bubble of delight, of joy, of happiness, of well-being? We'll get more into definitions, but what frees us to that? 
Maybe uh, this is a juncture just to pause and invite you just to check in for a moment on your own life and how this t- takes place in your life. In other words, how much do I actually experience happiness is the question. How much well-being is there? And if you close your eyes and you just scan today, this week, and just through that filter, has it been the thousand serious moves and have you been kind of caught and narrow and life is business? How much has there been a sense of really resting in a kind of well-being, appreciation, enjoyment, savoring? You can continue to reflect and you might include, um, these are kind of some of the the dimensions of well-being uh, that were really uh, put out by Seligman, who is the kind of father of, of positive psychology. So one domain of happiness is, is experiencing pleasure through the senses. Is that, is that so in our lives? Another domain is a sense of engagement, of flow. Just really being involved and engaged and going with activity immersed. How much of that? Another domain of well-being is feeling our relatedness, uh, the, the positive emotions that come with feeling connected with each other. Part of well-being is feeling a sense of meaning, of belonging to something larger than what we consider the ego self that belonging. And for many, part of well-being comes from a sense of of the kind of growth or mastery or accomplishment that's meaningful in a deep way to us. So it's a filter, just a sense. So how is it for this particular body-mind heart. Is there much well-being? And you can open your eyes when you'd like. The Buddha described two kinds of happiness. Now the first is called pamoja, that's the Pali word, and it's really the worldly happiness. And many of the things I mentioned to you just now had to do with worldly happiness. You know, it's the happiness and it's conditioned. It's conditioned on certain things being a certain way. So Pomoja is, you know, perhaps with a certain person or a particular accomplishment or tasty food. That's one kind of happiness. The second kind of happiness, which is the liberating kind of happiness the Buddha talks about, is called Sukha. And my favorite term for Sukha is happy for no reason. Okay? Happiness without cause. It's that sense of well-being that comes just out of our natural presence, just the beingness. When we're resting in that beingness, uh, the realization of really what we are, there is a natural sense of well-being, of belonging, of love, of freedom. So that's sukha. That's the unconditioned happiness. So I'm going to talk about the first, pamoja, because Pamoja can be very wholesome, can actually be a platform or a, a gateway to sukha. But it also can be a gateway to real suffering. So that's what I want to talk about for a little bit. Okay, so sometimes it's fleeting, this happiness that's called conditional happiness or pamoja, where it's just a, a good taste or a great massage or, you know, one of those perfectly aimed compliments like, you know, really, you're 63? You don't look a day over 61 or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Actually, that would be devastating, really, more like it. 
or you know, our team wins the Olympics, or you know, it, which is, you know, you just you do get a flash. There's research that shows, for men, especially for men, our biochemistry when our team wins. I mean, there's a real surge in the happiness chemicals, you know. So that's the fleeting kind of. Uh, happiness and then sometimes it's longer lived like when we really accomplish something that matters to us or time in a beautiful setting or a real creative endeavor that we're in the flow in it, then Pomoja it's still conditioned on something but it has a kind of longer life to it now even this conditional happiness um, can, can be really wholesome can kind of acquaint us with a sense of ease and well-being, uh, especially when we learn to savor, and that's going to be the next class. What are some of the ways that we can really work with what's going on in our lives to open our hearts? So, there's some beautiful expressions of conditional happiness, like the happiness that happens when we see someone else happy. It's conditional, but it's beautiful, and it comes from a very pure place. Okay are the feeling of happiness when our gratitude when somebody's been really kind to us or when we get touched by in a transcendent way by some exquisite music you know Mozart and we're just ah oh, you know it, these are very precious beautiful experiences on planet earth of conditioned happiness and when we hold them lightly when, when there's a kind of an open hand, we let them land and, and hold them lightly, uh, they acquaint our body-mind with really an experience of openness and freedom. And here's the difficulty. We are deeply conditioned to have strong preferences for some of our pomoja, that we want certain things a certain way, and we grasp and get attached and get fixated. And then it turns to pain. And there's a whole lot in Buddhism and in many traditions about the pain that happens when we get attached to conditioned pleasures. So it's an interesting inquiry and you can ask yourself, and let's do this inquiry right now, that if you just kind of close your eyes and say, all right, so what is between me and real happiness? and you might sense a certain relationship. Doesn't even have to be a real troubled relationship, but is there anything between me and happiness in this relationship? Or it might be a work, your work. Is there anything between me and happiness in my way of engaging in work? Or just at this time in your life, what is between you and happiness, if there is something? For many of us, as we ask that question, we touch into a kind of chronic anxiety in our system that's worried about something that's up and coming. Or we touch into a sense of hurt or anger at the way somebody's been behaving, or judgment. Or we touch into just a sense of, well, I'm not unhappy, but I'm just not there yet. I'm not really flourishing in my work or there's not real intimacy or it's just not enough. What I'm getting at is that what is between us and being happy is some sense that something's wrong or missing with what's right here. And it's really interesting if you stop in any moment in your life and say, well, right this moment, am I happy? you might find that there's almost a habit of things aren't quite right right now. You're kind of waiting for something or tensing against something. Something's missing or something's wrong. This is the conditioning. Am I happy right now? Maybe there's just a little physical discomfort. Not a big deal, but something tells us as soon as there's unpleasantness of any sort that we really can't be happy because something's wrong. 
that's the way our mind works. So it's very strong conditioning, and it's part of the survival brain. Very strong conditioning to keep scanning for what's wrong, to try to make things better, but not just rest in how it is. The more historic wounds or hurts, the more historic deprivation, the stronger that sense of something's wrong or something's missing is in our system. The more the thousand serious moves, we're always trying to control and manage things. One of the main ways this takes shape is what has been called if-only mind. And I'm going to ask you to check out if-only mind in your own life. Now, if-only mind is probably what you're imagining it to be, which is this, and it's a delusion, this delusion that if only such and such were in place, if only my body were healthy, or if only my partner would change and be who I want her or him to be, or if only wars would stop, or whatever the if only is, then I could be happy. So we've postponed happiness based on a condition, and we each have, from what I've detected for most of us, our, our favorite handful of if onlys. So. Sometimes it's, if only I could have this food, it's very, te- it's very immediate, if only I could have ice cream, then it would be really fun, you know, things would be fine. For a lot of us, it's, if only I could accomplish such and such, if only I could get these three things done today. Whew. I mean, have you noticed how much we hitch our relief and ease and well-being to getting certain things checked off the list? I mean, really, I'm, I'm not alone in this, right? I mean, because I, I see it every day going on. If only others would cooperate is big. It's really big. We, we really want others to, to change and be a certain way. Um, you know, it's, there's this tension in the pursuit of if only. If you check out if only, when it's there, it's not like we're just, there's some pleasantness that we're going, oh, how lovely. It's a have-to-have feeling. And with that, there's a fear of not having it, so there's tension, and we're pursuing. An honest seven-year-old girl admitted calmly to her parents that Billy Brown had kissed her after class. How did that happen, gasped her mother. It wasn't easy, admitted the young lady, but there were three other girls that helped me catch him. So, you know, it's, so it's this thing of, you know, it starts really early. I mean, in some way we're chasing after because our life isn't going to really work out unless we have the right partner. That's just a big one, just to name it. It's not truth, but it's big in our minds. Or the partner we have isn't, you know, it's, it is either grasping or aversion. It's not the way we want it. I remember somebody sent me this little cartoon and it had these two very fancy looking poodles lying in bed and one was kind of cowering, looking really ashamed and the other was wagging her finger saying, bad sex, bad, bad sex. (laughs) (laughs) So it's this thing of, you know, others are not the way we want them to be. And often we actually withhold our love. We're so in if only, if only you'd be different. We actually withhold our love because there's some sense in us that if we act loving, that's like positive reinforcement for staying the way you are. Isn't that true? So something in us is tight. It's like, I I saw another little cartoon with these very old couple that were sitting in rockers on a porch and he's saying to her, now you want an open marriage? You know? (laughs) So just just to reflect for yourself now, um, and I'm giving you a little bit of silly examples, but I think you get the idea. Um, So you might just close your eyes and ask yourself this one. Is there some way that you have some future happiness linked to something being a certain way that you're waiting for? Is there an if only that you're in some way waiting for yourself to change? 
If only I could work through this obsession or this addiction. If only this other person would change. If only that I could have this particular job with this financial security, then I'd be okay. If only I could tie up all the loose ends. Lose weight. Be healthy. And sense how much that is actually a trance that you're in. In some way waiting for something. You might even ask yourself, is it really true that if I got that, I'd be happy? It's okay if part of you said yes. (laughs) It's just a useful question. So the problem that I'm really talking about, which is not a bad thing, it's kind of a universal thing, is that we get hitched like our, our uh, longings get hitched in a narrow way. And really they're substitutes for what we really long for, which is belonging, love, you know, really uh, being fully alive. But we hitch it on, can I just be financially secure? Can I just have this partner or whatever it is? So there's a couple of very deep truths on why if only mind causes suffering. And the first one is, we are regularly wrong about what we think is going to make us happy. When it's these fixated wants. Um, there's a lot of research now, a lot of research on happiness. Probably you're, you're aware that if you, if you Google on Amazon for happiness, there are scads of books on it, articles, it's just, you know, it's like this culture is per- avidly pursuing happiness, and not, not actually becoming happier, but avidly pursuing it, um, but in a way that's got a lot of grasping. So, okay, so 13 studies show that lottery win- winners are ultimately no happier than non-winners, and paraplegics usually become as content as people who can walk. Now, that to me is powerful that we anticipate good things happening are going to make us happier and that bad things will make us miserable and we do have a temporary spike, it's true. That's why I said it's okay if you think it'll make you happier. It will, maybe, for a while. But after five months, this is the research that I've heard, it's from the positive psychology crowd, after five months, we return to our happiness set point. Many of you know that there's it's been discovered that we each have a happiness set point, which is generally where we land up whether good things or bad things happen. So we think it's going to make us happier. We hitch on to something. It's the story of a young man asked God how long a million years was to him. And God said, a million years to me is just like a single second in your time. Then he asked God what a million dollars was to him, and God replied, a million dollars is just like a single penny to you. Then the young man got up his courage. God, could I have one of your pennies? (laughs) And God said, sure, just a second. (laughs) It doesn't work. So we have this set point we think things are going to make us happier, they don't. But there's another uh, deeper, to me, reason that if only mind causes suffering, which is that while we're in the midst of if only, we're not here. We're not inhabiting our lives. Life's what's happening while we're kind of waiting for something to come together. And uh, you know, it can be really sad. I mean, I talked this week to a woman in her late 60s. Her husband's older than her, and he's now in Alzheimer's. And she was really going through a deep kind of uh, sadness because 
she was just kind of looking at the landscape of her life and how many years did she and her husband <clears throat> kind of postpone their own enjoyment in some way because <clears throat> they were trying to get his career together and feel more secure in this and get the kids in colleges and there was always something that in some way was between them just acknowledging, oh, this is it, here we are, let's just live it. And I think that's really common. I remember sharing several times with you how uh, one woman very, very involved with hospice work described the most common regret expressed by the dying was the sense of having lived up to other people's expectations of who they were or even their own internalized expectations but not living true to their hearts. They were doing the thousand serious moves kind of on that auto automatic thing. So if only mine, this, the, the ways we fix on something narrow keep us from fully occupying right now. Wanting is for the next moment to contain what this moment does not. Okay. So then the inquiry really is what allows us to see this trance and wake up to where the one, the one place where happiness is possible. You know, what allows us to really change that set point and really open to what's our potential? Because the Buddha said, I would not teach you about this happiness if it were not possible for you. And we get habituated. We get kind of resigned to our mood. It's just familiar. And I'm not talking about a kind of another form of attachment of, oh, I have to ha change my set point. <laughs> you know, it's not that. It's a sense, it's the wisdom in us that senses, oh, I have just forgot that there's a way of being that's possible, that's really possible. Possible and it involves becoming more holy who I am. So then we look at, you know, how this works and uh, I remember a couple of years ago I was about to give a talk on something like this and somebody left a little um, comic strip on my, on this seat I'm sitting on and it had this robot who was jumping around joyously. She's going, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free at last. I finally found my manual override button. <laughs> And I feel like it kind of sums it up that, you know, there is a way to override this conditioning to always be seeking after things being different. Because that's the conditioning. I mean, we are wired, our survival self is wired to be scanning for what's wrong and what's missing all the time. And we have the consciousness it's part of our makeup to become aware of that and step out of it. And that doesn't mean that we don't still look and notice when there's danger. And it doesn't mean that we don't pursue things we want. It just means that our lives are not possessed by it. There's more choice. And there's more arriving in the one place where there really is freedom. So the rest of our, our night tonight will be really um, how we evolve ourselves, how we let these practices wake us up out of the thousand serious moves. And I want to say that the conditioning to stay stuck, to keep thinking, oh, if only my health, or I can't be happy because you know, this is happening with my son or whatever it is. That conditioning is really, really powerful. So in order to move towards this freedom, it takes a very strong intention. 
as I said, we're kind of uh, accustomed and resigned. So it takes an intention to be happy. And that, again, in the research on happiness, they found that people that are happy actually intend to be happy. It's like they're choosing it. It's like this matters, it's possible, why not? So this dedication is really to our full potential. And I was very moved. I heard a, a story, I think it was last year, a friend of mine was at Spirit Rock uh, on the West Coast and was part of a year-long training for people of color. And so this woman that was part of the training was a community activist and, and had experienced a childhood of poverty and trauma and abuse and then herself she faced a lot of illness and of course culturally racism, single parenting of two children. So she, she had a rough life. And she talked in this group very openly, very vulnerably about the years of struggle to educate herself and to stand up for her beliefs and how she become radical to fight for justice in the kind of local and national politics. And she had been really grimly determined. And she had been doing the thousand serious moves with many, many elements of great dignity. So I'm not saying it's just like a, a blanket, it's not something that's a blanket trance, a lot of life to it, but she had been very, very grim. So in this group, one, the last meeting of the group, this woman announced, she said, after all the struggles and troubles I lived through, I've decided to do something really radical. She said, I'm going to be happy. And I, when I heard that, I really had tears because I realized the wisdom in that, which is, it doesn't matter what's happening. It doesn't matter what our diagnosis is or what's happening. There is a unconditioned well-being. It doesn't mean we're happy as in delightful joy happy. It could be the kind of compassion that feels tender and there's something in us that feels at home. But it's possible in the midst of any circumstance to come to a sense of being at home in that well-being. And the beginning, it's just what this woman said, she decided, I'm going to be happy. So when I hear that, I can feel it coming, that decision coming from a different source than that kind of goal-driven this is my next self-improvement project. It's like she sensed this is a possibility, this is my potential, why not? Why not? I had mentioned earlier Marty Seligman, uh, positive psychology, and um, I think it's, it's so important that that's part of the mix of what's available in the field because it's very easy for our psyches to think, oh, you're going to a therapist, something's wrong, you're going to fix it. Well, we can go to therapists and we can practice meditation because we sense a potential we want to unfold. So this is a little bit of his story here and I love it because he was asked to, he was asked what led him to really studying happiness. So, just a second. So, he, he said, um, the epiphany happened when my daughter Nikki and I were gardening and she was just five. I should confess that when I garden, I'm goal-directed, time-urgent. Nikki was throwing weeds in the air and dancing around, and I yelled at her. She came back to me and said, Daddy, do you remember before I was five, I whined all the time, I whined every day? Did you notice that since my fifth birthday, I haven't whined at all? <laughs> I said, yes, Nikki. 
Well, Daddy, that was because on my birthday I decided I wasn't going to whine anymore. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. And if I can stop whining, you can stop being so grumpy. <laughs> Good, good teacher. <laughs> so he says, in a flash, I saw that she was right about me. I really was a nimbus cloud, a nimbus cloud, and probably any success I had in life was probably not due to being a grouch, but in spite of it. <laughs> he said, I also realized that my profession and that psychology was half-baked, that the baked part was about suffering, but the unbaked part was about positive emotion and virtue and positive institutions. In a moment, in that classical religious sense, I acquired a mission. It's courageous to face the suffering in our life. And it's courageous to open to the well-being and happiness that's possible. And it takes some intention. <laughs> <laughs>